March 3rd, 1944, East Anglia, England. Lieutenant William Overstreet sat hunched over his small desk, the soft glow of a desk lamp spilling across his letter to Virginia. His hand trembled slightly as he wrote, not from fear, but from exhaustion. Tomorrow, he told her, they would attempt something everyone said was impossible, flying all the way to Berlin and back in a single-seat fighter. Through the frosted window, he could see ground crews working beneath floodlights, fastening strange brown cylinders beneath the wings of his P-51 Mustang. They looked like packages from home, paper-wrapped and fragile. Yet, these paper bags, as the pilots joked, would soon change the course of the war. The crew chief had laughed when Overstreet asked if they were serious. They'll hold, Lieutenant. Laminated paper and resin. The Brits have been flying with them for months. Few realized that these humble tanks, made in a converted newspaper factory, were about to rewrite the mathematics of aerial warfare. The key to victory would not be forged in metal, but pressed from paper. The crisis had begun the previous autumn, on what came to be known as Black Thursday, October 14, 1943. Colonel Hubert Zemke stood at Halesworth Airfield, staring at the operations board as reports came in. Sixty B-17 bombers lost, 600 men gone in a single day. Of the nearly 300 bombers that had set out for Schweinfurt's ball-bearing factories, more than a quarter never returned. The survivors told grim stories. German fighters had waited until the American escorts turned back at Aachen, then descended like wolves. For three hours, the bombers flew through hell, alone, and unprotected. The Thunderbolt fighters that guarded them were magnificent machines, but their reach ended just a few hundred miles short of Germany's heart. Beyond that invisible line in the sky, the Luftwaffe waited. In a small office at Bovington, Colonel Cass Hof studied an object that looked more suited for a school art project than a military breakthrough. It was a fuel tank made not of metal, but of laminated craft paper bonded with phenolic resin. Developed in collaboration with British engineers, the tank was light, cheap, and quick to build. Britain had begun using them out of necessity. Aluminum was scarce, every ounce reserved for aircraft production. Ho saw something else, an opportunity. The paper tanks weighed less than half their metal counterparts, meaning more fuel and far greater range. Built from layers of resin-soaked paper shaped over wooden molds, they were then lacquered and painted silver to resemble metal. They were ugly, they were fragile, and they were perfect. The first test came in February 1944. P-47 Thunderbolts of the 56th Fighter Group flew deep into Germany carrying these new British-made tanks. To everyone's surprise, they worked flawlessly. No leaks, no failures. Their range had grown by over a hundred miles. Then came the game changer, the arrival of the P-51 Mustang. Sleek, fast, and efficient. The Mustang was already one of the finest fighters of the war. With the paper tanks, its combat radius leapt from 475 to more than 850 miles. For the first time, Berlin was within reach. At dawn on March 4, 1944, tension filled the briefing room at Debden. A red ribbon on the mission map stretched from East Anglia all the way to Berlin. The pilots stared in silence. For the first time in history, single-engine fighters would escort bombers all the way to the enemy's capital and home again. One man whispered, Berlin. It was a word that carried both dread and destiny. By 3 a.m., the ground crews were filling those paper tanks. They had to hurry. The glue would begin dissolving after just a few hours in contact with fuel. But five hours was enough. Each tank was a marvel of improvisation. Three sections, nose, body, and tail. Each hand laminated and pressure tested. They held 108 gallons of high-octane aviation, fuel, and could function from the freezing heights of 40,000 feet to the summer heat of southern England. Most were made in 
the same plants that once printed the London Times. Women, who had worked the presses now, layered and glued sheets of paper for war. Back in the United States, skepticism was rampant. Air Force engineers at Wright Field dismissed the idea as unfeasible. Paper fuel tanks, they argued, would never hold up in combat. But in England, the proof was already flying over Europe. By the time the reports reached America, 15,000 tanks had been used without a single structural failure. Colonel Hu ignored the bureaucrats. He knew results mattered more than reports. The first mission to Berlin went exactly as planned. Hundreds of B-17s crossed into Germany under the watchful escort of P-51s and P-47s. Over Berlin itself, Luftwaffe pilots were stunned. American fighters were never supposed to make it this far. That night, a German ace wrote in his diary, Everything we have been told is wrong. For the bomber crews, the sight of Mustangs above Berlin was almost spiritual. Sergeant Dale Rice, a ball turret gunner, later recalled looking up to see contrails streaking above him, P-51s with drop tanks glinting in the sun. One waggled its wings, he said. We knew then. We weren't alone anymore. The results were immediate. Within weeks, German attacks on bomber formations declined sharply. Luftwaffe ace Walter Nowotny reported that the Americans have solved the range problem. Their advantage is complete. Behind the scenes, a quiet industrial miracle was underway. Bowater Lloyd, the London paper manufacturer, had converted its newspaper presses into war production. In just 72 hours, raw paper became a finished fuel tank. Women and men working in shifts crafted thousands each month. Distributed manufacturing spread across Britain. Small workshops, even home garages, all contributing. A single transport plane could carry hundreds of flattened tanks, where before it could only haul 40 metal ones. The tanks were simple to mount, quick to release, and, once empty, disposable. When jettisoned, they fluttered down into forests and fields, dissolving in rain within months. Farmers found them no more harmful than cardboard boxes. By May 1944, the results were undeniable. Bomber loss rates plummeted from catastrophic levels to less than 2%. Each paper tank, costing just a few dollars to make, saved lives by the thousands. Pilots discovered another benefit. When hit by enemy fire, the paper tore instead of exploding like metal, reducing secondary fires. As the Allied air campaign intensified, the tanks evolved. Resin formulations improved, allowing longer storage times and colder operating temperatures. By D-Day, every fighter over Normandy carried them. The invasion's success depended on constant air cover, and paper made it possible. Across 1944, as the Luftwaffe crumbled, these humble cylinders of laminated paper helped seal its fate. The Germans tried to copy them but failed. Their industrial system lacked the flexibility, the materials, and the decentralized manufacturing that Britain and America had perfected, captured. German reports admitted the Allies' disposable fuel tanks were a revolutionary concept. Luftwaffe, General Adolf Galland, later, confessed that the appearance of American fighters over Berlin marked the end of the air war. By the end of the year, the Allied air forces roamed the skies unchallenged. Mustangs struck rail yards, airfields, and fuel depots deep within the Reich. German industry collapsed. The same tanks that carried the fighters to Berlin also carried them back again, and to victory. Colonel William Kepner, commander of the 8th Fighter Command, later said simply, the paper drop tank gave us air superiority over Europe. Without it, D-Day might have failed. After the war, the legacy of those paper tanks continued quietly. The resins developed for their construction became the foundation of modern plastics and early circuit boards. The laminated press techniques inspired post-war industries, from aircraft interiors to television cabinets. The lesson was simple. 
innovation didn't always mean complexity. Sometimes it meant doing more with less. Even decades later, veterans still spoke of them with awe. At a reunion in 1995, former Luftwaffe commander Adolf Galland stood beside an American P-51, gazing at one of the silver-painted paper tanks hanging beneath its wings. This, he said, is what defeated us. The simple thing that meant we could never be safe again. The story of the paper drop tank is one of wartime ingenuity at its purest. When metal was scarce and men were dying, Britain's paper mills and America's factories turned fragility into strength. Together, they created a weapon so unassuming it looked like a child's toy, yet it carried within it the fuel for victory. When Lieutenant Overstreet finally flew over Berlin that March morning, he wasn't just flying a fighter. He was carrying the proof that simplicity, mass production, and human ingenuity could overcome even the most formidable enemy. The war in the air was not won by the mightiest planes, but by the humblest invention, a paper tank that turned distance into dominance.